right? But let me tell you what you can do. You can go person to person. You can find people out. And, and I've given out, I've told the staff, uh, I have made a personal commitment because our soul winning, we're not having our soul winning meetings as we normally would. We're not going out and doing door knocking like we would normally do on a weekly basis. And I've made a personal commitment myself uh, that I'm going to, personally, I'm going to give out 100 tracks a week. And I'm not going to just go and, 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 you know, if there's nobody out, then I may put it on the door. But I'm looking for people to put tracks in, in the hands of people. And uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, this last couple of weeks, I've been able to hand out over 300 of our new tracks. The one that says hope on there, I have not had one person turn the track down. And I always turn it around when I give it to them where it says hope right on there because there's a lot of folks out there that are looking for hope. And uh, I haven't had one person turn the track down. So <clears throat> again, we've got, to, we've got to be able to to stay church uh, active in our soul winning. We may not be able to see the amount of people down the aisle and baptize as we, as, as we lie. But listen, during this whole crisis, there are still people dying and going to hell. And, and we still have a responsibility. You know that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ as a church and I as a pastor, I don't think the Lord's going to say, now Pastor Lassiter, uh, you know, here at the judgment seat, we're going to bring everything into accountability except that four-month period when the coronavirus that you had to deal with. So we're just going to kind of toss that out, and we're not going to take that into accountability. I don't believe, I think we're going to be coming to accountability for everything that we're doing. Amen. And so just pray if you would. Uh, and uh, uh, so it looks like unless something drastically changes, uh, it looks like that we may have to live with our social distancing situation uh, until the school system starts. It's pretty definite that we're not going to be able to run our buses until the school starts back. That's kind of, uh, that's kind of a, a landmark that they're looking at. I was told that when the school district, when it starts back, they run buses, you can run buses. And so that looks to be kind of where we are right now. So just pray that maybe God will intervene and turn this thing around and all of this will happen sooner rather than later. Okay. So I just want to give you a quick report on kind of what's, uh, what's going on. And if you can join us tomorrow night on the National Prayer Call, I know it'll be a blessing to you. And that will be 7.30, and that's, that is Central Standard Time. And uh, so I hope that you will join us, uh, if you would. And then again, as more things open up and as we begin to offer uh, more ministries, I'll let you know. But thank God we've got a nursery open tonight, and it'll be open on Sunday. Our four- to seven-year-old children's churches will be back up and running on Sunday, uh, just be patient with us. Uh, we have trained the staff uh, to what to do, how to do it. And so these are not experts at what they're doing, but they're volunteers and uh, they're there for your kids. So be patient as we work through this, okay? All right, let's sing some more. Let's stand together. And I would tell you to turn to hymn 252, but it's probably not 252. Find each step I take. Dr. Reed, come lead us. Sing together. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand, he leads the way. And with each breath, I whisper, I adore thee. Oh, I joy to walk with him each day. Each step I take, I know. Until someday the last step will be taken, each step I take just leads me closer home. On the last, sing together. I trust in God, no matter come what may, for life eternal is in His hand. Each step I take, I know that he will guide me to higher ground. He ever leads me on until someday the last step will be taken. Each step I take just leads me closer.
seated. Church, it's my privilege to introduce to you uh, missionary Jonathan Hoffmeister. We support his uncle and have supported his uncle, who's a missionary uh, to Trinidad. And uh, we've supported him for a number of years. Uh, his home church is Capital City Baptist in Austin. And uh, very acquainted with the church, his pastor, and uh, just a great, great lighthouse of the gospel there in what has turned into be a very liberal city uh, in Austin. And so we're grateful that he was able to come and be with us. Uh, and Lord willing, uh, we will see uh, missionaries begin to filter in a little bit more on our Wednesday nights. And we're just grateful that Brother and Mrs. Hoffmeister took time out to drive up and be a part of our service here tonight and introduce you to God's call on his life. So Brother Jonathan, you come and uh, just give a quick testimony uh, to our church and then he's got a short video. We'll have a special and a short message on missions to remind us of God's uh, mind about world missions. Brother Jonathan, you come right ahead. God bless you, my friend. Good evening, church. It's good to be here again. My name is Jonathan Hoffmeister and this is my wife, Jacqueline, over here. And uh, our son Andrew is back in the nursery, and we are very thankful that they opened it back up. And uh, we are missionaries heading to the country of Ecuador in South America. Gets its name from the equator that runs right through the middle of the country, and uh, has Colombia to the north and Peru to the south. And it's famous for five missionaries that went there back in the 1950s and were speared by the Aka Indians, namely Jim Elliott and Nate Saint, Ed McCauley. And uh, those men, they, uh, they made a great impact on that country. And uh, growing up as a child, I had the opportunity to hear the gospel often. And uh, you'll see in the video, I got saved at a young age, and that was a blessing. And uh, shortly after that, at our missions conference, I was in kindergarten, and uh, we had all the missionaries come through. And uh, they were preaching and presenting and showing their slide presentations. And uh, God got a hold of my heart that week, and I surrendered to be a missionary. And uh, for a number of years, I thought I was going to be going to Mexico. And uh, started trying to work on Spanish and learn to enjoy spicy foods. And uh, took a lot of trips there through my teenage years, and I was excited about that. Went through Bible college, and uh, that's where I met my wife. And uh, graduated in 2015, and I uh, got married in 2016. And not long after that, I started hearing about Ecuador. Several people had taken a trip down there, and our pastor had, some others from our church. And uh, I kept hearing, you need to go visit Ecuador and see what the Lord is doing there in that country. And uh, all I had heard about it really was Jim Elliott and those stories. And uh, I thought pretty much the whole country was jungle. That's all I had heard about it. Uh, but January of 2018, I was able to take a trip with my pastor and a few other men in our church. We spent two weeks driving around the country and uh, visiting all the missionaries that we could find there. And uh, we found out that there weren't too many. And uh, there's some men that have been there a long time. They've been faithful and established works. Uh, but many towns and cities where there's no church at all that's preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, traveling around there, passed out a lot of tracts, preached on some of the streets. And uh, everybody was very receptive. They took them. We were able to see a few people saved on that trip. Uh, but the sad part is where they at, when they ask you, where's your church at? And uh, we'd like to come visit you. And uh, then to have to tell them, well, we don't know of one in this city. And uh, God truly broke my heart that trip and uh, showed me that's where he would have me to be as a missionary. And uh, people, they say, well, how do you know that God has called you there? And uh, I told them God made it very clear in my heart that to go anywhere else would be disobedience. And I surrendered to go there as a missionary. I took my wife back the following September. And uh, we started deputation last year in July, full time. And uh, we're currently about 80%. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to head down there at the end of this year, maybe January. And uh, all that depending on how things open up down there as well as up here. Uh, but we appreciate your prayers. And uh, if you'll grab a prayer card off the back table and pray for us, we appreciate your prayers. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for allowing us to come through here. Thank you, Pastor, for the hotel room and the gift basket and everything. You've been a blessing. We appreciate that. Amen. Thank you so much. There was a time in the early 1950s when there was a strong push for evangelism here in the country of Ecuador. Five young men gave their lives to reach this country with the gospel. 
Those men opened up a corridor, and after them, many more followed. Unfortunately, those churches that were started were not firmly grounded in the faith, and quickly were turned over to Pentecostal, Southern Baptist. Many of them are very liberal to this day, and are not reaching their communities with the gospel. Hello, my name is Jonathan Hoffmeister. My family and I have been called to the country of Ecuador with the gospel. There was a time as well that I realized that I was a lost sinner headed for hell. July 4th, 1999, as a young boy, I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Ever since that moment, I've wanted to see others get saved as well. I believe the time for Ecuador is now. There's something special in this country right now. Hearts are open. The people are willing to hear. They're turning away from the Catholic Church. And if someone's not here to step in and fill the void, many more souls will be lost. The cults have taken advantage of that open door. The Jehovah's Witnesses have planted over a thousand congregations in this country. With over 92,000 people, they have trained to reach people with their false doctrine. The Mormons have over 300 established worship centers with almost a thousand missionaries at any given time. In January of 2018, the Lord gave us an opportunity to drive all around the country of Ecuador. Starting in Quito, where we flew in, we drove north through Ibarra, Tulcan, across the Colombian border in the Ipiales, down south along the coast through Guayaquil. The town of Guayaquil, almost three and a half million people, larger than the capital of Texas, where I'm from. Only a handful of churches here, barely denting the need here in this great city. Millions of people that have honestly never had the opportunity to hear the gospel like you and I have. Such a great need, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. If I could ask you to pray for something, it would be for more laborers to this needy field. There's a glaring fact across this country that there's really not very many churches. We've seen a lot of Catholic churches, a lot of other ones, but there's a need for good Christian missionaries, Bible-believing Christians, to come down here and show these people how they can be born again. As we went through the town plazas, we saw people everywhere, many of whom were searching. People begging for tracks, people asking you to explain to what you were passing out. Often it's very sad because they assume you're Mormons just because you're from the United States, or they assume you're Jehovah's Witnesses if you're passing out tracks. And we've seen their influence across this country. I don't think it's too late, though. This country can still be reached with the gospel. We've seen revival fires spread across America in times past, but now is the time for Ecuador. Now is the time for us to come here and reach this country with the gospel. Lord's called us to come here. We plan on the first year starting out, getting a firm footing in the language, working with missionaries established in the area already, and then branching out into some of the unreached cities and villages around this country that have never had the opportunity to hear God's word. We'd love to be able to start a Bible college in the future. Ecuador could use a Bible college, teen camps, conferences. The need is great. The time is now to reach Ecuador. If we wait, there's no telling what could happen. God has given me a great burden for reaching the Spanish community in our church and around the world. Ecuador is a needy country, and the time is now to reach them with the gospel. The Bible says in James 4:14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. A lot of times we see this verse as good for witnessing, good for showing people that life is short and they need to be saved, but this verse was written towards Christians. And we need to remember that our time on earth is short. We only have a short space of time to witness, win the lost, see souls saved. Now is the time for my wife and I to fulfill the Lord's will here in the country of Ecuador. Perhaps now would be the time for you to join with us in partnering here with Team Ecuador in reaching this country with the gospel. Father turns his 
his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection what should I gain from his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom. Thank you, Brother Rayleigh. And a great message to a great song. You know, one of the things um, that it always encourages me and inspires me when we have missionaries in, and um, I pay attention to uh, the, the videos. I pay attention to what missionaries are saying. One of the things that I was encouraged with Brother Hoffmeister's presentation is um, though he would be a first-term missionary, about two-thirds of his presentation was witnessing, and passing tracts out, and street preaching. I think they're serious, don't you, church? And I just feel led of God. I want to be a part of their ministry. People that, that, that they're, they're, these, these are young couples. I'm encouraged. Dr. Smith says this all the time. You know, folks, God is raising up young couples like this to go all over, not just America, but around the world. This is God's business. He's raising up people all over America uh, to start churches and, and to, to go to foreign countries. And I just feel led tonight, church, to, to present to you. I, I would like to be a part of Brother and Mrs. Hoffmeister's ministry. And so I need a motion to that effect. And Brother Ingram, uh, you seem to have your hand up first. What is your wish? Okay. And so let the record show that Brother Terry Ingram has made the motion. And uh, is there anybody in the balcony who want to second that? All right. Brother Joplin, you would like to second that? All right. Uh, so the motion has been made by Brother Ingram. It's been seconded by Brother Adam Joplin. Is there any question? By the way, did y'all notice the same thing about their video that I noticed? Okay. That stirs me. Okay. About, uh, because I think this couple, and it doesn't mean that, 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 that nobody else isn't serious. It's just that. The, these, this young couple is serious about getting to Ecuador and getting some people saved. I don't know how much longer we have, church, 
But the thing about it is the quicker we can get these folks to the mission field, the quicker they can start churches, they can start winning people to Christ. And listen, some of these faces that you saw on that screen, some of them are waiting for answers. Some of them need to be born again. And so with the motion made and seconded, if there's no questions, all in favor by the uplifted hand. All right, very nice. You can slip your hands down. Anybody oppose missions, church planting, winning souls, Anybody like that in the balcony? Y'all good? All right, very good. And uh, so let the record show there is no opposition. And uh, so, Brother Hoffmeister, I believe that you have been in contact with Mrs. Via. I don't know if you have made uh, personal contact. So, Mrs. Via, raise your hand back here. This is our mission secretary. Make sure before you leave tonight that you give her contact where we need to mail the support. And uh, we'll, they will be supported uh, like our missionaries are at $100 a month. And they will, if you'll get with her, and she'll, we'll get that rolling the first uh, week or so of June. All right, thank you for allowing us to have a part in your ministry. Pick up a prayer card and add them to your prayer list. Acts 16 and Philippians 4 is where we're going to be for our study tonight. Acts chapter 16 and Philippians 4. Church, I want to talk to, uh, to, to you tonight, and, and really it's as much for me as it is for you, and because it, it certainly... Uh, seems to me like it has been forever since we've had a missionary in. And uh, it seems like it's been forever since we've seen missionary uh, presentation. And so uh, just I, I want to uh, step aside from our normal Wednesday night Bible study that we've been studying uh, for, homes for some time and talk to you about the mind of God toward missions. What is the mind of God when it comes to this thing of missions? Have you found your place in Acts 16 out of love and respect for the Word of God? If you can physically stand, let's stand together. We're going to begin reading in verse number 6. We're going to read down through verse number 13. And so to kind of keep you in context of the scriptures, this is Paul and Silas now on their first missionary journey together since Barnabas and Paul had separated. And uh, Paul had some ideas about where he wanted to go. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with having an idea about where you want to go if God's called you to a specific ministry. God's not against you having your own idea. Just make sure that he's in on it when you have that idea. Amen. All right? Make sure he's behind you. So Paul had some ideas about where he wanted to go. and uh, he, he felt led to go to Asia, and the Holy Ghost forbid them to go. And then he felt led to go to Bithynia. The Holy Spirit stopped there. And let's find out now from our text verses, where did the Holy Spirit want them to go? Because it's key, because when they followed the Holy Spirit, the church that was planted, the very first church they planted, when they followed the Holy Spirit of God, would play a key part in the Apostle Paul's ministry from this, for, from this time forward. So follow along as I read in verse 6, and then you'll read the odd number of verses down through verse 17. Now when they had gone through uh, throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden by the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia together. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit suffered them not. And they, pass, or, and they passing by Mysia, came down to Troas together. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying... Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them together. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi, and mark this now, because this is where it gets real interesting. Because Paul made a beeline to a very industrial city, a, very, a city that was, that was very wealthy in commerce. So what he figured he would do, let me just hit the most populous area that I can hit, and then we'll work out from there. But it was the Holy Ghost of God that led him to this place. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the church at Philippi was going to play a huge part in his support as he went from city to city 
to city. So notice what it says. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days together. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which restored it there. Now, we'll get to Philippians 4, so don't lose your place there. I want to talk to you tonight about the mind of God toward missions. Father, the few moments that we have, uh, I've just, I just felt, Lord, moved deep within my soul with, uh, in conjunction with our missionary guest, the missionary presentation, and we haven't had, uh, Lord, uh, a missionary in in a while, uh, just to, to try to just refresh our hearts and mind and spirit concerning this thing of world missions as it is laid out in the Scriptures. Would you bless the preaching and teaching of your word now tonight in Christ's name? Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Church, since the beginning of the Trinity Baptist Church some 48 years ago, this church has always had a heart for missions and missionaries. You know, our relationship as a church with missionaries has always been, we've always had a great relationship with missionaries. We've always been a very giving church to missionaries. We've always been a very grateful church when missionaries come in. And, and I think that when we have missionary guests in, we need to treat them as special guests. And uh, our church has always done that. So as a church, we've attempted to be a true friend to missionaries throughout our history. And because of that, church, God has put Trinity Baptist Church on the radar of most independent fundamental Baptist missionaries on deputation, and I know we're on every missions agency's radar because many missionaries uh, are recommended to our church by different missions agencies. Why is our church so recommended to missionaries? Because our church has proven that we are a very grateful church to missionaries. We are a very giving church to, to missionaries. And that our church has always been a church that has felt that it is a great privilege to have a part in supporting world missions. So our reputation is not one uh, that, uh, that is to be taken lightly. And I don't say that to draw attention to ourself, uh, church. But the reason I say that is because I am so happy to be a part of Trinity Baptist Church and our missions program because it glorifies God. And that is all that our church has an intent to do. And that is glorify God by supporting the preaching of God's word, the planning of new churches around the world. Where do we get the pattern from? We get the pattern of missions and the method of supporting missions from the Word of God. So it's without question, church, that the reason Trinity Baptist Church has been blessed and used of God for 48 years has a lot to do with this church's attitude toward missions and toward missionaries for all of these years. You know, missionaries should never become faceless figures. You know, many times um, we, we, we support missionaries and, and, uh, I, and I talk to you about missionaries and their names are on our prayer sheet. But God help us if our missionaries ever become faceless figures to us to where we don't recognize them and we don't read up on their prayer letters and, and keep up with what's going on. So missionaries should never become faceless figures that exist somewhere out on a foreign field. Church, listen to me. Missionaries are real people. They have to face real problems. They have real needs. They have real issues that they have to deal with. And by the way, they have real families just like you have families as well. Missionaries on the foreign field, they're not exempt from plumbing problems. They're not exempt from car problems and flat tires. And, and uh, they're not exempt from medical issues and sick kids and on and on and on. Hey, church, all I'm saying is missionaries have needs also. And they must never become faceless figures to us. We ought to regularly walk around and look at the pictures of the missionaries that we support. Why? To embed in your mind the face of these missionaries and determine they'll never become faceless figures. But they'll be, they're real people that have real needs. 
You know, the mission scenario that we're looking at here, this is where we get the format of how world missions and the relationship between missionaries and the local New Testament church. By the way, somebody ought to say amen right there because missionaries need to be sent out of local New Testament churches. They need to be sent out of a church. They need to be supported by local church, uh, churches uh, as well. And uh, so the missions scenario that we're looking at here is the Apostle Paul uh, pretty much, not he doesn't just preach this method, he practiced this method. So the scenario that we just read about in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas had plans to go preach in Asia. The Holy Ghost said, no, we're not going to Asia right now. Then the Apostle Paul said, but I've got a burden for Bithynia. But the Spirit of God says, no, we're not going to go to Bithynia. Well, I don't understand. I have a burden for Asia, Lord. I have a burden for Bithynia. Why can't I go? Because I'm going to send you to a place where you need to go because I've got a people there in Macedonia that's going to be an asset to you for the rest of your ministry. He said, so we're not going to Asia, we're not going to Bithynia, we're going to Macedonia. And God gave Paul a vision. And did you notice in the scriptures that when God revealed the vision, notice what it says in verse 10. And after he had seen the vision, does your King James Bible say immediately? They didn't even waste any time. They said, okay, you know what? Boy, I have a burden for the people in Asia. Boy, I have a burden for the people in Bithynia. And by the way, church, it's wonderful. Nothing wrong to have burdens. But you listen to me. You follow the voice of the Spirit of God and you go where He tells you to go. You do what He tells you to do. It's okay to have a burden for other cities. But if God says, listen, I want you to go and pass out tracts and win people to Christ in Arlington, follow the Spirit of God. People need to be saved in Grand Prairie and other areas. And listen, if the Lord tears is coming, we'll get to them. But if God says go to Arlington, that's where you need to go. And Paul immediately went into Macedonia. Now, here's the thing. Once they got to Macedonia, the Bible says that, uh, they, that on the Sabbath day, if you'll notice verse number 13, they went out to the city I went out front of the city by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made. Now, listen carefully. Normally, Paul's custom was when he went into a city, who was the first group of people he was looking for? He's looking for the Jews. He was looking for a synagogue. Now, it doesn't appear that there was a synagogue, and let me tell you why. Usually, it was Jewish protocol in this day that if there were 10 Hebrew families in a city, then a synagogue would be set up. If there was not 10 practicing Jewish families, then normally they would find a place, sometimes outside the city, and they would call it a place of prayer. So as Paul looked around, and obviously there must not have been a synagogue uh, at that particular time, so what he did is he found out, okay, where's the place of prayer? Where he found the place of prayer was down by the riverside. So him and Silas make their way down by the riverside, and the first person they contact is a woman by the name of Lydia of Thyatira, a seller of purple. Here's what happens. They win this lady to Christ. She was baptized and her household got saved. So guess what, what they found in Philippi? They found Lydia and her household and she was the first converts that Paul and Silas had in Philippi. Hey, it's looking pretty good now because they followed the Spirit of God and the first, it appears that one of the first contacts that they made, they had converts. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good way to follow. If you're following the Holy Spirit, that's, that is a wonderful thing to see somebody saved. But if you'll follow along in the rest of the chapter, if you remember, there was a young girl that was being made merchandise by a couple of guys using her because she was possessed of a devil. Remember, Paul kind of got to the point where, look, I'm tired of seeing this. He cast those devils out of that young lady. So now, guess what we have? We have Lydia in her household and a young girl that was possessed of a devil. So now we've got these converts. Remember, Paul and Silas get arrested. They get thrown in prison. Earthquake takes place at midnight. 
The jailer hops in. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And thy house, the jailer believes, his household believes. They're all baptized. And guess what we've got? Now we've got Lydia and her house, the, little, the girl that was possessed of the devil, the jailer and his family. Those are the charter members of the church at Philippi. You say, great, wonderful. But think about this for a second. Lydia, out of all of them, was probably the only one that had a little pocket change to her name. The jailer probably got fired, right? Now, he probably he was going to kill himself, but he probably got fired from his job, so now he's jobless. You got a, you got a girl that was possessed of the devil. She didn't have anything anyway. So now you got, you got charter members that don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot to their name. Okay? Now keep that in mind. This is going to come back into play here in just a minute. They don't have a lot of things. And by the way, if they did have any money, they needed it. They certainly didn't need to be giving it away to somebody. They probably needed it for their own needs. So the church begins there in Philippi with Lydia's, Lydia in her house, the little damsel that was possessed of the devil, the jailer in his house. He's probably jobless right now. So it appears that these are the charter members of the church that Paul started in Philippi. Now listen carefully. What, we just, what I just re, uh, relayed to you, this is how missions is to work. A missionary goes into a city, listen now, and a place led by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen, missionary? You go where the Spirit of God says go. When you go where the Spirit of God says go, I promise you there's a work waiting for you. And so they go to Philippi. That's not where he wanted to go. That's where he meant, God meant for him to go. And now they planted a church in Philippi. The membership's not looking real strong financially though. Okay, so, so what he does is they, they start this church there. And uh, so the missionary goes in to where God sends him. He wins people to Christ. They have a church gathering together. Listen, dear church, this is what missions is all about. The missionary follows the leadership of God. Souls are won. Churches are started. That's how it works. All right? This is how, this is the Bible model. Now, I want you to go over now to Philippians chapter 4. I want you to look at something. Philippians chapter 4. So we're going to talk about how missionaries are to be supported. Now, the interesting thing about this is the church at Philippi, you say, well, that church was started by the Apostle Paul. Well, technically it was started by the Holy Spirit because Paul wanted to go start a church in Bithynia. The Holy Spirit started this church. Okay? And he used Paul and directed him there, Paul and Silas, to start this church. And listen, <laughs> hindsight being 2020, the Apostle Paul now writes a letter back to the church at Philippi. Remember their charter members? Lydia, her family, they were probably the only ones that had any money. A little girl that was possessed of the devil, she didn't have anything. And then they've got a jailer who probably got fired after he let uh, uh, Paul and Silas into his home. And so, so he probably doesn't have a job. So you've got a charter members and very little money. Matter of fact, the needs that the charter members of the church at Philippi had were probably greater than the needs that Paul and Silas had. They probably needed the money more than the missionary did. Now keep that in mind now because Paul now writes back to the church at Philippi later on. And the church at Philippi becomes now a model of faith promise giving. Now wait a minute, let's remind us, who started this church? The Holy Spirit used Paul to start the church. Did Paul want to go there initially? No, he did not. He wanted to go somewhere else. The Holy Spirit sent him to the city where the church needed to be established because it was that church that was going to be his strongest supporter. Okay? Now I want you to look at it when he writes back to them. In verse 13, Philippians 4. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now listen, we read that verse and we say, amen. And by the way, we preachers, we've preached that about every angle that you can possibly preach. But look up here at me, church. You're going to find out that in the context in which that verse is written, 
down from verse 13 down through verse 19, Paul is talking about missions. Now, wait a minute now. He said, I can do all things through who? Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. But remember now, Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. But listen, but here's the key. Here's the key. Shall men give unto your bosom? So he says, now, there is going to come a flow from a source that God is going to move in to supply the needs of the missionary. Now look what he says. Paul said, I can do all things. But why could he do all things? Because there was a supporting church that believed in faith, promise, giving called the church at Philippi. They didn't have a lot, but they gave. Look at it. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate. See that word communicate right there? That word communicate in the context right here means a monetary gift. It means an offering uh, of, of kind of, of a like regular support. He said, you have communicated to me. He's not talking about getting on a cell phone. He's talking about communicating financially. Now notice what he says. That ye did communicate with my affliction. Now he didn't say you sent money because they beat me with rods. He said you sent money because I had a need. And you communicated to those afflictions. All right, notice verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, which remember, once he went, left Philippi, went to Thessalonica, they didn't like him very much in Thessalonica, so he went to Berea. So he left Berea, remember, uh, 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 Thessalonica and Berea pretty quickly, and then went to Athens and then on to Corinth. He said, so when I departed from Macedonia, look at this, look at this, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. What does your King James Bible say right there? He said, you're the only church. Now, wait a minute. What if Paul said, I don't care what you say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to Asia. Then he would have gone hungry. What if he had said, you know what, I, Holy Spirit, I know I'll get to Macedonia, but I'm going to Bithynia. That's where my burden is. And the Holy Spirit, listen, the Holy Spirit would have had no choice. Okay, if this is where you want to go. But I'm going to tell you, you're not going to have a supporting church if you go there. So he sent Paul to start a church in Philippi by probably one of the biggest ragtag group of charter members that you could come up with. But that ragtag group of charter members plus others that got saved and were added to the church, listen to me, was going to be the only church that supported him on his missionary journey. And the only reason the apostle Paul had sustenance, was not just the hand of God, but he followed God's leadership. Look at verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once, wait a minute, look what he says. You didn't just send one support check. You sent a support check. What's the next two words? And again, to me, you know what that sounds like? That sounds like monthly support to me. That sounds like the church at Philippi was sending funds regularly to him. He says, so you sent once and again unto my, does your Bible say necessity right there? Look up here at me, church, don't miss this now. Are you going to miss everything about the message tonight? Remember the charter members of Philippi? Ragtag group. You got a kid possessed the devil. She didn't got a thing. She didn't got a, probably a penny to her name. You got a jailer that's probably unemployed. He doesn't have anything. Lydia's probably the only one that can, can even afford to tithe. And so here's, here the, so she's over here. She's probably the only tithing member. Let me ask you something. Would you think that maybe that church at Philippi had probably a ton of needs? But what did they do, church? They didn't look at their needs. They gave to support the needs of the missionary. And so he said, you gave once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Look at verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Now notice this. He said, man, I started getting regular monthly support. Missionary, correct me if I'm wrong. 
But when you start seeing churches take you on, and you start seeing the support coming in, look at the text. Would it be an odor of a sweet smell to you? Oh, yeah. That support comes in. It's like, man, that, that support smells sweet. Now, listen, but you know what that missionary also knows? That that church at Philippi sacrificed to make this happen. Amen. So that missionary says, oh, your support was a sweet smell, a, a, an odor of a sweet smell. He said, a sacrifice acceptable. Paul knew. Man, the last time I left y'all, I looked at the financial report. Boy, there wasn't anything hardly in there for missions. But I keep, I keep getting support. I keep getting financial support from this church that doesn't have a lot of finances coming in. So Paul the missionary says, oh, it's a sweet smell, a, 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 an odor of a sweet smell. It's a sacrifice acceptable. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. It's well-pleasing to God. Why? Because guess what we did tonight with the Hofmeister family? Brothers and sisters, we partnered up with them. Hey, I'm excited tonight because you know what? If everything falls into place and they can get to Ecuador in the fall, guess where I'm going? I'm going to Ecuador. Right? I'm going to Ecuador. Why? Because I'm investing in their ministry and we're partnered together with them. Church, listen to me. Can I say to you tonight, have you figured it out? This is the mind of God when it comes to missions. This is how it's all supposed to work. Now, let's get to the last verse and stop here. How many times have we all, don't raise your hand, we've quoted Philippians 4.19. Have we not? And many times we claim that verse when technically many times the way that we claim that verse isn't applicable to how we claim it. Amen. Because you know what the context of, verse, context of verse 13 through 19 is? It's missions. Yeah. Hmm. So, Paul told the church at Philippi, because you are missions minded, because you gave out of your deep poverty, because you gave out that because of my necessity, he said, listen to me, because you gave out of your own needs money that you needed, you took and gave it to meet my needs. He said, I'm going to tell you something, church. But my God shall supply all your, look at your King James Bible, need. He said, church, I wonder if he had that old uh, uh, Philippian jailer in mind. Boy, that old boy didn't even have a job. How's he getting? That little girl possessed of the devil, where's she getting money? Maybe she's picking cans up. I don't know. What about Lydia? She's the only one that had any money. She was a seller of purple. So, you know, she, she had probably the nicest camel in town. So she must be the only person giving. I don't think so. Now you listen to me, church. Don't miss this now. That church at Philippi existed because the missionary followed the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. And you know why? Because the Holy Ghost had something far more in mind than the missionary did because the missionary was going to need that church because in the tough times, that church was the only church that supported him. Amen. Yeah. But I wonder if that old Philippian jailer reached into his pocket at the church service and the preacher got up and said, listen, it's time to give our faith promise to the missionaries. We're supporting missionary Paul and missionary Silas and, and it's time to, to put your faith promise in. Maybe he reached into his pocket and he pulled out his last five bucks. And he thought, boy, you know what? I really need that because I got a sick baby at home. And I could really use that five dollars to go buy my baby some medicine. And I really need it. But Lord, I'm going to give it to you because there's a missionary out there that came and started this church, and I'm saved today because of him. And so I'm going to give from my need to his need. Now, don't miss this. This is the message. 
with the claim of the promise that my God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So church, here's the message tonight. The promise of God is this. When we sacrifice to give to missions, when we sacrifice our own money that we may need to supply the missionary's need, then God said, I will supply your need when you need it. Amen. Now, wait a minute. You know what this is going to take? That's the reason it's called faith promise giving. Because every one of us, I promise you, when you give to faith promise missions, you make a commitment, you give to God money that you probably need for your own family. That you probably need for something that you have coming up that you know that you're going to need that money for. But let me tell you something, church. I have found out that Philippians 4.19 is a missions verse. And I have practiced that verse and I have given and I have given just like you have given. And I looked at that promise and I thought to myself that, listen, when that missionary gets that support, it's, a, it's an odor of a sweet smell unto him. They understand it's a sacrifice, acceptable. But they also understand that they partnered with, with the church, the church partnered with them, and it's well-pleasing to God. And God just simply said, local church, Tough times are going to come. Hey, folks, let me tell you something. This coronavirus pandemic crisis, whatever you want to call it, it's put some of our folks in a financial bind. Listen to your pastor. Please listen to me. I'm telling you from experience. Do not stop giving to missions. Because when you give out of your need, God promised that I will supply all your need when you need it. It's faith, isn't it? Basically, it boils down, are we going to trust God or are we not? And I think that day, as the offering plate was coming down the aisle, that old Philippian jailer, maybe without a job, maybe he got fired that day because he let all these folks go. And he saw that offering plate come and he pulled that last $5 out. And he looked at that and he looked at that $5 and he said, you know what? I'm going to have a need one day. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give out of my need, money that I need. I'm going to give out of that to supply the missionary's need. So in the day when I need it, God's going to be there to supply it for me. Not just a little bit, but good measure. Press it down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give him to your bosom? That's, that's the words of Christ. I'm here to tell you, I'm a living example of Philippians 4.19. Living example of it. There have been times in my life, it came down, am I going to give my faith promise or am I going to put a new tire on the car? Am I going to give the faith promise or am I going to go and, and or, or am I just going to go and take some duct tape and tape the old faucet up and let it run for a while until God supplies? And you listen to me, church. God has supplied every single time. Why? Because he's promised. He promised that he would. You say, preacher, what is this? This is the mind of God when it comes to missions. And church, don't miss that truth. Too great a truth to leave without. I know you have needs, but you give, you give to missions. You give to missionaries so that churches can be started, people can be one around the world. You give to missions out of your need, and God will supply your needs Amen. when you need it. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just a moment tonight. Thank you for your attention. I wonder how many can say tonight, you are saved. You know it, you've been born again, and if Jesus came back tonight, you're heaven bound, you're not ashamed of it, you'd slip your hand way up high. You say, Pastor, here's my hand, I am saved. All right, all right, good, good. 
Good. All right, you can put your hands down. Thank you for being honest tonight. I looked around the auditorium and it appeared that everybody's hand was raised. But just in case I miss somebody, and I don't want to, don't do it intentionally, but just in case I looked around, I didn't see a hand that was not raised, and you'd raise it now, and you would say, Pastor, pray for me. I do not know for sure if I die and go to heaven. Maybe you've been struggling with this salvation thing. Maybe those of you that are watching us by way of, of, our, of our stream uh, tonight, and you're watching us uh, via YouTube or Facebook or however you're viewing us tonight, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I ask you tonight, what are you waiting for? The greatest gift ever given to mankind was the gift of Jesus Christ. Is there anyone here tonight, you'd slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I do not know for sure that I'm saved. Anybody like that? Anybody? Balcony, bottom floor, anybody? Okay. Is there anybody tonight, you say, Preacher, I've already been saved, never been baptized. I know it's the right thing to do. That's my next step of faith. Pray for me. I need to take that step of faith to be baptized. Remember now, you don't get baptized to be saved, but because you're saved. Anybody like that? And you'd slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. Anybody like that? Okay. Then, child of God, can I ask you a personal question? Has there been times where you've struggled? You knew that if you wrote on that offering envelope and gave your, work, your, your commitment to missions, you knew that there was a need in your own personal life. And you knew that when you wrote that down and gave, that there was a need that you have, that you thought, just like I thought, was going to go unmet. And you found out you were wrong in your philosophy. That God supplied all your need. How many tonight can slip your hand up and say, Preacher, I'm a living testimony that giving to missions and God supplying my need when I need it, it is true, it is true, it is true. How many could slip your hand up just like mine tonight and say, Pastor, I am a living testimony, no question about it. I remember the times it's happened. You can slip your hands down. Listen, I can't tell you how many times Dear church, that it's happened in my, in my younger days of Christianity. I didn't know. I just believed God. I just wrote the check and I said, Lord, Philippians 4.19 uh, is there. And, uh, and God never failed. God came through every time. Thank you for that testimony. That is encouraging. And I hope it's encouraging to you. For those of you that maybe find yourself in that boat and you say, Preacher, there's been times to where I, I didn't give it to, to, to missions because I, I had a need at home. I had a leaky faucet or I had a tire. Listen, we've all been there. We've all been there. But let me, let me help you with something. Just trust God. Trust God. Father, the service now comes to a conclusion tonight. I believe that we've learned something. I believe that our, our hearts have been inspired concerning the mind of God toward missions. We've looked at the format, how it all works out and, and kind of the relationship between the church and the missionary and, and just how blessed that we could be if we just be faithful. Just be faithful to give our faith promise missions. Yes, it's tough times. This coronavirus has caused a lot of heartache and a lot of financial uh, burdens uh, upon uh, our folks. But Father, if we will be faithful and we'll be consistent, and oh God, if you laid a, a, an amount of faith promise on our hearts that we give, we need to be true to that, Lord. And uh, every week, every month, however the folks give, because Father... It was the Apostle Paul who followed your sweet voice. He wanted to go one direction. You guided him another direction. Thank God he had enough spiritual discernment to follow the Spirit of God, to plant that church in Philippi because it would be that church, that church was the only church that supported him when he left Macedonia into Achaia, on into uh, Athens, and on into Corinth. Matter of fact, Lord, I remember the Apostle talking about there in, in, in his second epistle to the church at Corinth that he robbed other churches to meet the needs of those in Corinth. And he was referring to the church at Philippi because they were giving. And Father, not every church is a faith promise church. Not every church has a world vision. But Father, I'm thankful that I'm surrounded by people tonight that have a world vision. And it has nothing to do with, with lifting up the Trinity Baptist Church. It has everything to do with lifting up Jesus Christ. 
Because, Father, I looked across this auditorium and nearly every adult hand was raised and said they were a living testimony that giving of their need to meet the need of a missionary on the foreign field that you supplied their needs when they needed it. What a great truth. Help us to be true and faithful to it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Well, listen, thank you so much for your attention tonight. Brother and Mrs. Hoffmeister, we're going to stand, church, if you would. Let's stand together. Dr. Reed's going to come and lead us in our final song.